is Dr. Alan Behrman. I'm a professor of history, dean of university libraries, and the Center for Student Success at Washburn University. And I'm very glad to welcome you to this year's iRead presentation. The Washburn University iRead program officially began in 2007. So this year we're celebrating the program of our 14th book. It's a biography of Washburn alumnus Art Fletcher and his place in modern American history. The iRead initiative is built around the concept that shared experiences matter. That shared experiences matter both within the Washburn community of learning and life beyond the walls of our campus. In the shared experience that is iRead, first year students at Washburn read the same book, discuss the book, think about the text, and then interact with the author so that they can really, in a holistic manner, understand where the book came from and why it is so important. Our model in September 2020 is like so many things in life disrupted by a global pandemic. So we're thankful to Dr. David, David Garland, our iRead author, for his patience and flexibility in developing a socially distanced and modified form of iRead lecture. Before formally introducing Dr. Garland, I want to offer thanks to our iRead supporters, the Friends of Maybe Library and the Washburn Women's Venture Partners, both contribute to ensure the, occur the occurrence of iRead. They provide the funding necessary that you and I can enjoy and learn from this shared experience. They do this year after year, so we offer them our continuing thanks. Thanks are also due to President Jerry Farley and Vice Pre President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Julianne Mazacek, because their ongoing commitment and support of the iRead program allows us to do this each year with first year students. Now, for our speaker. First, let's thank Dr. Garland for joining us. Dr. David Hamilton Garland is a professor of history and coordinator of the humanities program at Governor State University. He also currently serves Governor State as the president of the Faculty Senate. In 2011, Dr. Golan published a book, Constructing Affirmative Action, the Struggle for Equal Opportunity with the University Press of Kentucky. Then in 2019, published this year's IRE selection, A Terrible Thing to Waste, Arthur Fletcher and the Conundrum with the Black Republican with the University Press of Kansas. Together, these two works and others make Dr. Golan one of our nation's foremost experts of affirmative action in United States history. Scholars have agreed with Dr. Gold that Art Fletcher is the most important Republican civil rights activist of whom you've never heard. They've lamented the fact that too much of modern American history has ignored the contributions of Art Fletcher. Dr. Golan's book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, is a correction to that historical record. It returns Art Fletcher to his appropriate place as an important participant in the modern civil rights movement. And we are incredibly glad that that is the book we chose this year for iRead, because more than ever, as Americans, as scholars, as educated citizens, we need to think about the role of civil rights and affirmative action. We need to understand the conversation in which we currently participate. Art Fletcher, a Washburn alumnus, offered much to the conversation. Dr. Garland really illuminates the role of Art Fletcher in a way that is important and should, I hope, provoke much thought among you, the reader. We are again incredibly thankful and appreciative of Dr. Garland's joining us to present the 2020 iRead lecture. So at this stage, I will step aside and allow him to present. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Behrman. It's uh, such an honor to be selected, uh, to have my book selected as uh, the 2020 iRead selection by the Maybe Library at Washburn University. And I'd like to also take this opportunity before I begin in earnest to thank all of the faculty, staff, and administration at Maybe Library, but especially Sean Bird and Martha Imperato, who have been very helpful uh, these past few months. 
Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Paul Fletcher, the son of Arthur Fletcher, who without attempting to influence the conclusions of this book, uh, was uh, almost a partner, let's say, because um, I don't want to call him a partner because again, that would imply influence. Um, but he was very, very helpful in helping me to identify uh, the necessary sources and also to clarify certain uh, questions that I had about his father and other members of his family. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Mark Peterson, uh, the former chair and now professor emeritus of political science at Washburn University. Uh, Mark did a lot of uh, important initial work on the Arthur Fletcher story uh, back in 2003 and uh, later published an article on the Kansas origins of Arthur Fletcher. Mark also, uh, I would call him almost a pseudo partner. Uh, Mark did not attempt to influence uh, my conclusions in the book in any way, but he was a really, really important um, helper in, for, uh, at so many levels when it came to uh, producing the Arthur Fletcher story. So what I'd like to do um, uh, today is, is three things. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about Arthur Fletcher, who he was, tell a little bit of his story, your having the opportunity to read about this in much greater detail in my book, but I'll just give you a basic overview. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about my process as a historian, how it is that we go about uh, doing these sort of things, uh, creating uh, academic books of history, uh, and how I came to the story of Art Fletcher. And then finally, I'd like to wrap up uh, with a few takeaways, a few things that uh, our freshman students and anybody who watches this um, can, uh, can take away from this conversation uh, forward. So um, let's begin with who, who was Arthur Fletcher. So Arthur Fletcher was born in uh, December of 1924, and he died in July of 2005 at the age of 80. Uh, he was born um, perhaps literally on the wrong side of the tracks, um, but certainly figuratively on the wrong side of the tracks. He was born into poverty. Uh, he never knew his birth father, so he was raised by a, a single mom. Uh, and in fact, it was, uh, he did not even have the attention of his single mom for much of his early childhood as uh, poverty and racism forced her to leave him with various relatives um, around the Southwest, um, the corner of the country that I would define as uh, where Kansas is basically the Northeastern corner. Uh, so pretty much everything West and South and everything in between um, from where you are in Topeka today. Uh, he bounced around in Oklahoma, in Arizona, and in California, uh, as well as in Kansas in his early childhood um, because of the difficulties his mother faced in raising him and in raising his brother Earl. Um, when uh, his, his, his life ultimately changed uh, as he uh, moved into uh, the final years of junior high school when um, his, mother, uh, his mother met Cotton Fletcher, uh, which was Cotton was the nickname for this fantastic uh, horseshoe uh, engineer, really, the fellow who did the, the shoes for the horses all over um, the United States Army posts all over the American Southwest uh, for probably the first third of the 20th century. And Cotton Fletcher gave Arthur Fletcher the last name that he would use and that he would pass on to his own children and indeed his own stepchildren um, in the same way that he took his name from uh, his stepdad, Cotton. Um, and he also gave him stability. So with the stability that Cotton Fletcher brought to Art's mother, they were able to bring back Earl and Arthur into the household. And they settled in Junction City, where Cotton was assigned um, to be a horseshoer. Uh, farrier is the actual term uh, I learned in my research. Uh, it's not a term that we use a lot nowadays. Um, at uh, Fort Riley, uh, where the, uh, the local uh, Buffalo soldiers were stationed, the 9th and 10th United States Cavalry, uh, what we then called colored troops. Um, in Junction City, Arthur became a teenager and he became a football star. And by his senior year, he became the first African-American to be named to the, I think it's the Topeka Capital Journal that was uh, producing a roster of all state high school football players. Um, and, uh, and so that was kind of his first brush with, uh, with fame, if you will. And uh, from there, he went into the United States Army um, uh, served in the segregated armed forces, uh, made it all the way over to Europe, was part of the second wave of the uh, Normandy invasion, uh, which basically means if you're in the second wave, 
there aren't Nazis shooting at you from the bluffs. You're just kind of making your way across and, uh, and moving up, up into the coast at that point. Um, so it's not the D-Day invasion, but it's about a month and a half later that Art Fletcher makes it into France and ultimately makes it all the way into Germany, uh, mostly behind the lines as a trucker. But once in Germany, uh, he is shot, uh, possibly by what we today call friendly fire, uh, and possibly not. Um, but he, it is a rather serious wound in the abdomen that uh, takes him out of uh, combat and leads to his uh, being evacuated uh, first to England and then to Colorado, uh, Aurora, Colorado, outside of Denver, where he is treated and ultimately discharged from the army. Uh, at that point, he's your age for the most part, those of you who are freshmen. He may be a couple of years older because of his army service. And he uh, decides that he wants to go to college. Uh, now that the army is a closed path in, he had originally wanted to follow his dad uh, into a career uh, in the military. Um, and so deciding to go to university, he uh, takes advantage of his football prowess. And uh, initially he gets into uh, what I think was a big a big eight school at the time. Now we have, uh, when I was a kid, it was the big 10. And now I think it's the big 12. I haven't paid that close attention. You'll have to pardon me. Um, but uh, up in Indiana, where um, he actually found Jim Crow significantly worse. He found racism significantly worse uh, in Indiana than he had back in Kansas uh, as a youth. And uh, But uh, the football coach down at Washburn University, your own Washburn University, uh, threw him a lifeline and said, hey, we've got this scholarship. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not a scholarship. He used the GI Bill to go to Washburn, um, but he was on the football team and he very quickly distinguished himself as a, a member of the Washburn squad. And uh, by his senior year, um, uh, although there was incredibly fierce competition in his senior year, he graduated in 1950, incredibly fierce competition for professional football slots, uh, frankly, because so many GIs had gone to college when he did in 1946, right after the war, that he was competing with all of the graduating seniors in football, as well as um, uh, folks who um, were already playing pro ball. Uh, and um, the other problem that he was facing was that the, le the leagues shrank. Uh, I think one of the leagues actually collapsed uh, in right after the 1949 season. And so um, facing a very, very uh, difficult job market for professional football players. Um, nevertheless, he went out to where his mother was living at the time, uh, west of Los Angeles in, Cal in Southern California. And he walked on um, to try out for the Los Angeles Rams. And he was accepted into the summer, uh, into, the, into the team for the summer uh, exhibition season, played several games with the Rams, including a very important one where they, uh, they went to San Antonio to play the Baltimore Colts. And uh, they beat the Baltimore Colts and he made a few important passes. Uh, sorry, important, gotta get my terminology straight. He made a few important uh, catches and ran, um, uh, ran some pivotal yards to make uh, a number of points that the, the team otherwise would not have made. Uh, didn't clinch the victory himself, but he distinguished himself as an important player uh, not as important as some other players on the team who ultimately got to stay, but important enough to catch the attention of the losing team. And the Baltimore Colts uh, coaches at that point went, well, we, we got to get this guy Fletcher. Um, the thing about that was Baltimore, uh, in the heart of uh, Jim Crow, Maryland, uh, at the time, uh, had never had an African-American play on their football team. And uh, so they actually integrated Baltimore football the Colts were integrated when they hired Arthur Fletcher uh, to come east and play for them. Uh, unfortunately, he did not, Arthur Fletcher did not distinguish himself during his brief time with the Baltimore Colts the way he had on the Rams and the way he had at Washburn. And his career ended after about three weeks. Uh, they were back in California. And um, after yet another loss, the coach basically came to him in his hotel room and said, I'm sorry, Art, you know, you're cut. Um, wavered, et cetera, and uh, he returned to Kansas. And he had a couple of, a couple of years where it was a kind of a rough go, uh, got himself a teaching certificate um, over there in the, the Shawnee uh, County Public Schools. Um, but then ultimately, because of some connections he had made at Washburn, was able to um, uh, take advantage of some of, the friend, some of those friendships, uh, including, uh, most importantly, Fred Hall, who was running for governor 
1954, I think, is the year that we're at at this point. And uh, Fred Hall wins, and he makes Arthur Fletcher the deputy highway commissioner for the state of Kansas, just at the time that the Eisenhower Highway, uh, interstate highway construction is taking place all across the country. And as you all know, Kansas is right in the middle uh, of this country. And so there's an incredible amount of um, work that the deputy highway and influence, I should really say, that the deputy highway commissioner for the state of Kansas is going to be involved in. And he, uh, Arthur Fletcher, manages to parlay this in what today we would probably call corrupt uh, government behavior, uh, corrupt behavior by a government official, but at the time was uh, considered perfectly normal, nothing wrong with it at all. He parlays it into a uh, several side businesses, including a, a used car sales business. He had this huge lot with used cars that he would uh, he would get uh, folks at uh, Forbes Air Base and Fort Riley um, pre-cleared for their loans, and he would provide them with these uh, used cars. And he had an entertainment business where he was renting out uh, local armories. Um, in fact, not just local, but all over Kansas and the surrounding states and um, picking up money uh, because he was bringing in people like Ray Charles, right? Um, and, uh, and those sort of performers. Um, and uh, then it all kind of collapses when Fred Hall uh, not only loses the governor's post, but loses big after, um, uh, after a variety of other shenanigans that, that Fred Hall was engaged in. And um, things kind of keep going from bad to worse. And ultimately Fletcher is basically run out of Kansas. And he, um, Fred Hall moves to California and, and throws Fletcher a lifeline, gets him a job up in Sacramento. Uh, Fletcher brings his family with him to Sacramento and things continue to get worse there. Uh, at the same time, his wife is having uh, psychological difficulties that um, after further difficulties in Sacramento, they moved to Oakland in the Bay Area and Mrs. Fletcher ultimately takes her own life by jumping uh, from the, the Bay Bridge, uh, the Oakland Bay Bridge um, in 1960. And this really shatters the family and it shatters, of course, Fletcher's own worldview. And he goes from being the sort of politician who wants to, uh, take advantage of the system for his own benefit, perhaps for his family's benefit, to being the sort of politician who really is more of what we would consider a statesman, someone who really is looking out for other people. Um, and uh, with that realization, he becomes a, a, he becomes a community leader um, in Berkeley uh, and Oakland and elsewhere in the East Bay. Uh, he runs for uh, a seat on the California State Assembly uh, does fairly well, but he loses. And he realizes the problem is that he is a Republican. And he's in a state, he's in an area where African Americans are winning public office, uh, the Bay Area, again, especially the East Bay. Um, but it's not a place where Republicans are having all that much success. And he calculates that he needs to be running for office in a place where his race will not be held against him and his party definitely will not be held against him. And ultimately, he accepts a job uh, in uh, doing community work up in uh, the Tri-Cities area, uh, up in, um, in, the, in Washington State, in fact, the southeastern corner of Washington State, where he, uh, he builds um, a reputation as a self-help community organizer, and then ultimately runs for city council, uh, a seat that he wins in uh, 1967. And at the time, he and one other individual in Seattle uh, become the first ever African Americans to win city council seats anywhere in the state of Washington uh, in 1968. Um, from there, Fletcher uh, uh, moves on to, um, uh, he gets himself onto a committee at the state level. He makes friends with the governor of the, of the state of Washington and um, ultimately is convinced to run for lieutenant governor in 1968. Uh, sorry, the previous, the city council race was 67. Um, but in 1968, he runs for lieutenant governor, wins the Republican primary in every single county of the state of Washington, which is no small feat, um, considering that um, racist organizations, their, their own memberships were far stronger in the Republican Party at the time than there were African Americans in the party in Washington state. And yet he wins all across the board, the primary and comes almost within a, you know, a hair's width of winning the general election 
uh, so close, not close enough to force an automatic recount, but close enough that he could have paid for a recount uh, legally if he had wanted to, and ultimately he decides not to, because in 1968, someone who his, his governor had just connected him to uh, had just won the American presidency, and that's Richard Nixon. And um, now he has this connection who's going to the White House, and sure enough, Richard Nixon appoints Fletcher Assistant Secretary um, of the Department of Labor. Uh, in the spring of 1969, where the very first thing Fletcher, after you know, getting himself comfortable in his office and figuring out what his job is going to be and all those sort of things, um, he all the he brings together all the the folks who will work there and he brings together all the paperwork that had been created by the previous administration and he immediately sees this thing called the Philadelphia Plan, which was basically the government's first uh, affirmative action program. And it hadn't failed. In fact, it had started to see success, but then the folks who were opposed to it had sort of ganged up on the program. And ultimately when the Johnson administration had been leaving office, they had just kind of shoved it in the drawer and Fletcher looks at it and goes, well, this is perfect because it's not about unfair advantages, right? It's about um, leveling the playing field and giving people who are talented the chance to show their talents um, in the employment arena. And that was Fletcher's big thing. And so Fletcher looks at this and goes, we've got to redo it. We've got to put it forward. And he does. And the revised Philadelphia plan, which he launches on July, uh, sorry, June 27, 1969, um, is, is still in force today. Uh, although it's had, I mean, it, it's had a number of um, uh, conversions and, and there have been some issues with it. But basically, it's the beginning of affirmative action. Um, as a government uh, commitment at that point. Um, and it's uh, in particular, it's looking at the building construction trades, all sorts of details that I talked about primarily in my first book, but that I touched on in the chapter of this Fletcher book, um, because it, it draws him into the discussion of the building construction trades, because that's where, that's kind of like the tip of the spear for affirmative action, um, where uh, in a nutshell, you have an industry where um, uh, African Americans trying to break in, no matter what their skill, no matter what their training, were shunted into the unskilled trades, uh, the bricklayers, uh, etc. And uh, to become a member of the skilled trades, you basically had to have a father or an uncle or some other uh, sponsor who was willing to bring you in. And so, therefore, the skilled trades throughout the country in building, in building construction were pretty much what we would call lily white. And so, uh, Fletcher takes a bite out of this and again, starts to see some success. And again, as, has hap as had happened with the Johnson administration, uh, starts to make enemies. Um, the sort of enemies that you can imagine someone would start, would start to make um, who was pushing this sort of a program. And um, these uh, enemies are looking for kind of gotcha moments, if you, can, if you can imagine. And then ultimately Fletcher, who was not anti-union, um, he, he was just uh, wanting the unions to do the right thing and allow people into the union regardless of the color of their skin. Um, Fletcher makes a statement that was sort of accidentally uh, anti-union or was construed as being anti-union, even though there's no other evidence that I've found in his entire life of making anti-union statements. Um, and of course, this is seized on um, by very important union leaders who are concerned about the Philadelphia Plan and Affirmative Action and the changes that are being forced on them uh, by the federal government. And they convinced President Nixon to dump Fletcher. Now, dump Fletcher is a bit of a strong statement. Ultimately, what, uh, what Nixon decided to do was remove Fletcher from his position of authority in the Department of Labor. Um, and not, not totally uh, dismiss him from the administration altogether. In fact, Nixon offered Fletcher a job, which was a fairly important job. He, he made Fletcher part of the United Nations delegation under an ambassador uh, to the United Nations, whom you've all heard of, uh, because he later became president of the United States himself, and in fact, so did his son. I'm talking, of course, about Arthur Fletcher's most important political friendship of his entire life, and that was um, none other than George H.W. Bush, who in 1971 with Arthur Fletcher and a number of other individuals, was assigned to the United Nations. And uh, during UN week and the rest of the session throughout the fall of 71, Fletcher was attending committee meetings at the United Nations, primarily, of course, the Human Rights Committee, very important 
um, in United Nations work in international relations and uh, had a couple of great moments where he, he stared down the Russian ambassador and uh, you know, talked about um, uh, the role of African-Americans in the United States um, as despite all of the Jim Crow problems as still being preferable uh, to the ro role, uh, to the position of downtrodden minorities in the Soviet state. Uh, he made a very excellent point with that. In fact, um, there is some evidence to indicate that because of his performance at the UN, that Nixon was prepared to offer him a permanent job at the United Nations. Um, I have no uh, written evidence of that. I only have anecdotal and um, oral evidence, but I do talk about those evidences, th those pieces of evidence in my book. Um, ultimately, however, Fletcher did not stay at the UN because he had been offered a very different job, a job that would um, uh, give him the opportunity to participate in the creation of a phrase that you have all heard at this point, and that ultimately provides the, the, the main title for my book, uh, A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Waste. He takes a job as executive director of the United Negro College Fund, and he begins in January of 1972, just as the, um, the various external groups to the organization are finalizing that very phrase. And uh, Fletcher comes in and he sees some problems with the phrase, um, and he has a variety of reasons for why the phrase is problematic, and he changes it. And the final changes that he puts into it are what end up being the final phrase. So it's not as if he came up with the phrase from whole cloth from the beginning, and he was responsible for it beginning to end, but he made those final changes that result in the phrase that we know today, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Um, and in fact, had a fairly um, positive year working for the United Negro College Fund. The primary job of the executive director is to raise money that is used to fund uh, scholarships for people who will attend historically black colleges and universities. And that particular year where Fletcher was executive director, the fund raised more than it ever had before. But then they fired him. <laughs> um, uh, and I explore in my book the various reasons uh, that we think he was fired. And I say we, meaning all of the folks who were involved at the time. Uh, and I put my own spin on some of these theories. Uh, but ultimately, um, the, the historical fact is that he was fired. The historical argument is why. And I while I can draw certain conclusions, I cannot say with any definitive, um, uh, uh, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, exactly why. But I put the I put certain arguments out there, and I hope the readers will um, uh, make their own interpretations on that one. Um, another couple of difficult years, but he does return to Washington D.C. Um, at this point, he has remarried. Uh, his uh, his children are pretty much out of the house, um, and. Uh, and then in uh, 1976, a new president who has been president for a year and a half at that point, Gerald Ford, uh, thanks to Fletcher's politicking and all of the friends that he had on the inside, uh, Gerald Ford uh, offers Fletcher a position in the White House where basically he is Gerald Ford's uh, campaigner in African-American neighborhoods around the country. And Fletcher gives it uh, what we might call the good old college try. He goes all over the country drumming up support for President Ford's we should say election bid, not re-election bid, because President Ford was never actually elected. He was the first and only president uh, to not be elected into the position uh, because he was never elected vice president in the first place either. Um, and uh, and ultimately he is part of, uh, he has, he's, I, I don't, we can't blame Arthur Fletcher for Gerald Ford's loss in the 1976 presidential election, but um, he does not succeed any more than anyone else does. I guess that's the best way to put it. And when Ford leaves office, Fletcher leaves the White House as well. Uh, Fletcher at the time is building up um, consulting, a consulting firm on affirmative action and, uh, and then takes a break from that in 1978 to run for mayor of Washington, D.C. And it's the first completely open race for mayor, uh, that is without an incumbent. They had only been doing uh, mayoral races for a few years at that point. Prior to that, the mayor uh, I think had been appointed by the President of the United States. And they had a number of home rule um, elements that were added to their charter in the 1960s and 1970s, resulting in the ability of uh, Washingtonians, uh, that is Washington, D.C., to elect their own mayor. He runs, gives it again the old college try, uh, 
Uh, but here's another example of uh, just like back in the Bay Area uh, in Northern California, um, you kind of need to be a Democrat to be elected uh, mayor of Washington, D.C., although he does better than expected, let's put it that way, in 1978. Uh, and in, in 1980, he holds his nose and he supports Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign uh, and is on a committee that goes around and uh, talks about various issues um, um, in the Reagan versus Carter race in 1980. Uh, and then is not rewarded with any position in the Reagan administration uh, after the election. Uh, he has to wait until I think it's 83. Uh, and then he's finally sort of get, thrown a bone as it were. Uh, and he's made vice chairman of the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Commission, which is an organization that's sort of uh, half, uh, half public and half private. And they raise money and put money into um, the projects that take place up the, that are being built at the time up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, many of which uh, you folks have seen if you visited Washington, D.C. Um, uh, and uh, just like everything else he does in his life, Arthur Fletcher throws himself into this wholeheartedly. And then he gets a real break. In 1988, um, his friend, his good friend from the Nixon administration, from the United Nations, is elected president uh, on his own third try, or, or second try at least, Bush had been running for president, had ran for president in 1980, and at one point was even the front runner for the nomination. Well, Bush gets elected president in 1988, and he pulls Arthur Fletcher along with him, makes Fletcher the chairman of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, which is a really big deal. Um, and uh, Fletcher serves as chairman until the election, uh, or until about a year after the election of Bill Clinton. Um, his, uh, one of the things he focuses on while he's chairman is frankly trying to convince his friend, President Bush, to sign the Civil Rights Act of, uh, I believe it's the Civil Rights Act, uh, Civil Rights Bill of 1990, which he fails at convincing Bush to sign. Ultimately, Bush vetoes that one and then succeeds in convincing him to sign almost the same thing in 1991. But increasingly, the issue is affirmative action. Um, Arthur Fletcher continues to be a champion for affirmative action but the Republican Party at this point has uh, distanced itself very uh, carefully from affirmative action. And, uh, uh, and that's the sort of the stumbling block for this particular act. And that uh, sort of sets the stage for Arthur Fletcher's final act in public life. In 1995, the year before the presidential election of 96, the front runner for the Republican nomination, who ultimately wins the Republican nomination, Bob Dole, uh, disavows affirmative action. And Bob Dole is from your state, as you know, um, and he's still around. And in fact, I talked to Bob Dole, uh, uh, interviewed him in preparation for the Fletcher book. Um, when Bob Dole does this, uh, Arthur Fletcher uh, begs and pleads with him not to do it. Ultimately, Dole does it anyway, disavows affirmative action. And Fletcher says to himself, well, the only thing I can do is run for president. And so indeed, Fletcher mounts a campaign of course, all of his public statements are very positive. I'm going to win this. All presidential candidates always say they're going to win. But Arthur Fletcher um, is enough of a realist to understand that he doesn't have a snowball's chance in Hades of actually winning the Republican nomination. It is ultimately a, uh, it's a campaign for the purpose of getting the word out that, in fact, the Republican Party doesn't have to be opposed to affirmative action, that we can continue uh, to have this discussion here in this party, I say we referring to Arthur Fletcher, I'm not talking about my own politics. Um, within this party, we can have this discussion. It doesn't need to be a, a litmus test the way it is becoming. Um, and so Fletcher fails on a number of levels. Of course, he fails to win the nomination uh, for the 1996 um, presidential election. Uh, but he also fails to prevent affirmative action from becoming a litmus test for uh, Republican leadership. And it is uh, so today. Uh, in order to be an African-American uh, in public office in the Republican party, you need to show your anti-affirmative action bona fides, um, which is pretty much the opposite of where Arthur Fletcher stood. Um, and that brings us to Washburn in 2003, uh, which is a, in some sense where I began where um, Mark Peterson and, another, and a group of faculty uh, from Washburn, um, primarily I think from the political science department, invited Fletcher back and Fletcher sat for this fantastic, uh, basically 16 hour interview uh, 
where he covered his entire life from his perspective, of course, in great detail. And um, uh, Professor Peterson was really kind enough to give me uh, a digital video copy of that interview. And I used it as one of the major primary sources as I put together the book. Um, and of course, as I said, Fletcher died in 2005. So the second thing that I wanted to talk about, and you'll forgive me, I'm obviously going long, but the beauty of the, of the circumstances we're in, I think, is that you folks can just fast forward. <laughs> if, if I'm taking too long with anything, just go ahead and skip 10 minutes and see where I'm at at that point. Um, but I guess the second thing that I want to talk about, talk about is my process. Um, how I came to do this. And, uh, you know, as with Fletcher's life, I could tell it long, I could tell it short. Uh, I tend to think of it kind of as a, uh, the, that air piece on that, the bag, the bagpipes, right? Um, or a xylophone, right? It expands and it contracts. I can tell you part of it in a contracted version and part of it in an expanded version. And that's what historians do in any event when we do our work. Um, we often have to give very quick background and then expand to get into the meat of what we're discussing in our article and in our book. And then we give kind of very quick epilogues to kind of bring people up to date. So we can sometimes cover 40 years or 400 years in a single chapter and then take eight or nine chapters just to cover a single decade. And then we go back to another very, very quick wrap up. Um, and I, I'll do a little bit of that for you when we talk about, as I did with Fletcher, when we talk about me and my process as a historian and how I came to this project. So I was um, once upon a time an undergraduate, just like so many of you, um, a freshman and then a sophomore and uh, trying to figure out what I was going to major in. And I, um, I'm very fortunate that um, I was raised in an academic environment. Uh, my father was a professor of education and a psychologist by training. And so I went to college um, with the mindset that the most important thing was to graduate. And in order to graduate, the most important thing is to major in something that you enjoy doing, that you enjoy learning, not that your major should sound like a job. And so I have no, um, I have no problem with people who take an undergraduate major in computer, uh, computer science or business administration or nursing. Uh, if you really honestly think that that's what you're going to do for your entire life, by all means, major in it. But for most of us, I think, we should look at the university as a chance to expand our horizons. And that's the way I saw it. So I majored in my favorite subject from high school, uh, which was history. And um, it was a lot of fun. You know, I got to take these wonderful courses about the past and, and learn about the different perspectives that people had and the different ways that people learned about the past. And again, the only, main, the only real goal was to get a college degree. And I will add, as I always tell my students, the vast majority of history majors do not go on to become professional historians, nor should they. Um, the people that I graduated college with, uh, at my fellow history majors, are, they are mostly lawyers, I would say. A slight majority of them went to law school. A couple of them went to medical school. Um, they had taken enough biology or pre-med classes. Some of them, I guess, had minored in, um, in uh, those areas. But, uh, but I think I'm the only one. I may be the only one from that cohort who uh, even attempted uh, a PhD in history. And, um, and there was by no means a certainty that I was going to do that. Uh, it's just that I had professors who came up to me even before my senior year who told me that they thought that I was getting good at it and that I should consider a career in it. And so ultimately I did. Um, and I had a good topic uh, in, as an undergraduate and as a master's student. So um, I was focused on uh, African-American employment. And in particular, I was focused on African-American employment during slavery. So that is to say the employment of slaves, how uh, the work that slaves actually do, the labor that slaves actually did in American slavery. And I was particularly interested in the sort of not the typical um, world that you might see in, in mythological movies like Gone with the Wind. I was interested in slaves that were employed not in agriculture, not on plantations, but in industry, in factories. And there's a lot of 
um, there's a lot of evidence of that, and there, there, there's a lot of uh, instances of slaves in great numbers who are employed in industrial pursuits, um, which is to say they're working, they're toiling in factories just as hard as uh, the people who are getting paid to do it, with the major caveat that they're not getting paid. Um, uh, although in some cases they're given allowances if they're asked to live on their own, which is sort of like the worst of both worlds. Now they have to find a place to live. Now they have to feed themselves and the money's never gonna be enough to do that um, because they're not making uh, a profit on their own labor, which is something I think we all obviously uh, uh, expect um, from our own work. So, I mean, that fascinated me. It fascinated me how it worked um, and, um, and why it worked. In fact, one interesting term I, came, I found was that when an individual in a Southern factory would um, employ slaves in addition to free people, they would call that integration. Isn't that interesting? That a term that we have in the 20th century that means people coming together, um, we mostly think of it in a positive way, people being able to ride in either end of the bus, right? Um, people being able to live in the same neighborhood regardless of the color of their skin, people being able to, being able to send their children to the same school regardless of the color of their skin. Um, that uh, in the antebellum period, it means slaves as well as free people working in the same factory. Just a remarkable usage of that term that I found. And so as an undergraduate, I did a project on that for the state of Maryland, not for the state of Maryland, about the state of Maryland. Um, I did it for my professors and for myself. And um, that was my undergraduate thesis and it won an award. And um, I guess it, to some extent it helped get me into the University of Virginia where I then sort of repeated it, um, learning more tools as I went, uh, learning more skills and employing more tools as I went now as a graduate student. Um, but at that point I was focused on doing sort of the same story for the state of Virginia. And I did that. Um, uh, for my master's. And then for a variety of personal reasons, I had to leave the University of Virginia and I started up at the City University of New York uh, to complete my doctoral studies. And while I was there, I sort of felt like I'd exhausted the topic, really. I, I felt like I wanted a different area. And I had a great professor, Professor Judith Stein, the late, great Judy Stein, who um, she said to me, well, you know, why don't you look at affirmative action? So I took a look at affirmative action and I changed centuries. You know, I moved from the 19th to the 20th century. And I found that there was this remarkable program, the Philadelphia Plan, which what struck me as interesting about it was, here's something that both the Johnson administration and the Nixon administration are trying. And I want to take a look at that. And I took a look at that and ultimately wrote a dissertation on it. Um, and, uh, and that dissertation with very few changes uh, became book number one. And so, by the way, if any of you do choose to go on and get a PhD in history, um, my, my most important piece of advice for you is write your dissertation as book ready as possible uh, because it's a very tight job market for professors of history. It has been for over a decade now. And if you wanna get a job, the, one of the first things that's gonna be looked at is um, your scholarship. And if you can get that dissertation converted into a book, as quickly as possible, all for the better. Um, but while I was working on that dissertation, I discovered Arthur Fletcher. And um, <laughs> discovered is the wrong word. It's, it's kind of like Christopher Columbus showing up and saying to the Indians, congratulations, you've been discovered. But in my own personal perspective, I discovered Arthur Fletcher. He didn't need me to discover him, nor did anyone in his family need me. Uh, to dis they existed without me. Um, but I was just talking him up and I was talking about how fascinating, fascinating I found him. And one of my readers, Professor uh, Josh Freeman of the Grad Center at CUNY, uh, he said to me, well, Dave, why don't you just scrap this dissertation and just write a biography of Art Fletcher? And I joked, oh, well, maybe for the second book. And um, had no idea that I would be successful, that the, first, that the dissertation would be published, um, that I would get a job as a professor that would allow me the time to put together a second book. But when all those things did come together, uh, I revisited that idea, which had been a joke and now became a very serious thing for me. And I uh, devoted uh, the better part of a decade um, to, my, uh, to my pursuit of the story of Arthur Fletcher. And um, 
Uh, and then, the, you know, let me talk a little bit a bit more about my process. So what is it that, um, what is it that we historians do and what is it that I do? So um, the, the traditional way that historians have worked before we had all this computer technology was you went to an archive and you requested the documents through finding aids if they were available. And you would then spend hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. And in some cases, years and years in that archive, pouring over these documents, uh, in some places, taking notes with a pencil on a, on a pad um, next to the document. Because um, of course you can't write on primary sources um, in archives. And uh, what do we do nowadays, or at least what do I do? It starts out the same, you visit an archive, but it's a much faster process. Finding aid or not, you still have to look through all the documents to find the ones that are going to be relevant. But then I just, uh, I, even, even back when I was doing my dissertation back in the late 2000s, I had a digital camera and a tripod and I set these things up in the National Archives in the reading room, in the Library of Congress manuscripts room, and in all the presidential archives that I visited and pretty much anywhere else that allows it. Most of these places do allow it now, although I had um, an experience once at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Mass, where they force you to go back to the pencil and pad version, which <laughs> takes a while and kind of, I think, is reason for anyone to not do colonial and early American history and do stuff that's more modern. Um, but yeah, just snapping away with the, with the camera on the tripod. Um, and uh, if you find a folder where you're going to need all the documents, then you're just you take a picture from the tripod, you flip the page, you take another picture, you flip the page, you take another picture, and um, you get that done as quickly as possible because time in the archives is precious. Time in the archives is expensive. Um, in some of these cases, I was given funding by the archive or by my institution or by a different institution, um, but uh, you have to pay, in, you know, most of these archives are not where you live, so you have to pay for the travel. Um, you have to pay to get there and get back, of course. You have to pay your hotel uh, for being there. And, uh, you know, especially if it's going to take more than a day, which mostly it does. Um, and, uh, and that takes money. And so you want to make it as quick as possible. And so I just go ahead and I shoot, shoot, shoot with the camera uh, every single possible document that looks relevant to my thesis. And then when I, and then I, copy them, of course. You never want to leave the archive having done all this with just a single folder on one computer. Um, in more recent years, we've had versions of the cloud. And so I, I personally use Dropbox nowadays. And so it automatically uploads to the cloud. But I remember um, there were nights, uh, I think, for instance, when I was at the Gerald Ford archive doing this project, which is over in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where um, I would get back to the hotel and I would plug in a thumb drive to my laptop and I would copy the entire day's work to that thumb drive. And I still have like a string of thumb drives. I should probably wear them around my neck uh, <laughs> um, with, you know, each day's work because, you know, they're so big, the, the file sizes. Now it's a lot easier to just go straight up to Dropbox. You just have to remember when you, when, you know, keep your computer on while it's still uploading. Then the second stage is when you get back home and you open it up on the computer in your workspace. Then you actually read the documents and you start to develop a narrative. Um, and then finally, as you develop a narrative, you write. And, um, and I personally don't do all the research and then write the entire book. I research and then I write and I let the documents drive me. But what that means is since I write history chronologically, which is to say, I start at a certain period of time and I move forward, um, I need to first make sure that I have every document in chronological order so I could read the right documents this month so that I could write about them in the week after this month, right? And um, so I'm not reading a lot of documents from different points in time. And so um, before I could even begin really reading the documents and, uh, and writing about them, I have to create metadata for each one and I have an Excel spreadsheet for each project and it begins with the date of the actual document. And the document could be a paper document, it could be a recording, the Nixon tapes, for instance. It could be the Fletcher interview from 2003, uh, which is dated 2003, I think it was April 2003. 
Um, but then I can use my Excel spreadsheet to put everything in chronological order, and then I could start reading the documents or listening or viewing the documents in chronological order, and I can look at an entire decade's worth of documents in a given month or a given semester and then write about them. And, and I try to, that's an important part of my process. I, as I said, I try to let the primary sources guide my thinking about the story. And of course, at some point before all this, I will have read a whole heck of a lot of secondary sources. And then when I get to the writing of a particular period, then I'm finding more secondary sources. And for those of you who aren't historians, you may not know the difference. So the primary sources are these archival documents or other types of uh, sources that get you back to the original source. And secondary sources are books mostly written by historians um, about the past, right? And so um, I'll often start by reading 10 or 20 books on my topic, then do the archival work and read the archival documents. And then as I'm writing, I'll grab some more secondary sources to kind of keep that stuff fresh. And you're gonna need all that stuff uh, to have it on hand at any particular given moment because every time you write a sentence, let alone a paragraph, let alone a section, let alone a chapter, you've got to be citing those sources. And so if I'm going to say something like, here's why Gerald Ford lost the presidential election of 1976, it's one thing for me to have the documents in front of me, but I also want to be able to show this historian said, here's why, and that historian said, here's why. And then those all end up in a footnote, which ultimately in the book becomes an end note. Um, so write as you go. And another piece of advice I would give you for those of you who are doing writing, which is all of you, um, write at the right time of day for you. Now, I like to write in the early morning. Um, I, I was never really an early bird uh, as a teenager, as a youth, but I found that when I got into this process, um, I, I was very fortunate because I, in graduate school, I became a father. And when you become a parent in the modern world, um, you're a co-parent or a sole parent, of course, but in my case, a co-parent, but, but that means that I'm participating in the child rearing. And, um, and that means you're getting up several times in the night if that, when my kids were that age, and you're getting up in the morning. And uh, in more recent years, I've been getting up in the morning to put them on the school bus, right? So I had to become an early bird in grad school uh, for that reason, and it was a very happy, Coincidence, it turns out all those years I was wrong about not really being an early bird. I just was groggy for a few minutes, but it turns out I was actually pretty good in the morning. I just need a little bit of coffee uh, to get me going. And um, so I found that the morning is right for me. For some of my colleagues, uh, very late at night is right for them. Some people like to write in the middle of the day. You have to figure out your body's rhythms and what works for you. Um, I like to tell the story of uh, Victor Hugo when I talk about this which is, um, and some of you may have heard of Victor Hugo. He was perhaps the most important French, if not Western uh, novelist of the 19th century. Probably not Western, let's just say French. Um, Cause I'm, I think Dickens would probably give him a run for his money, but um, certainly uh, he's revered in France as their, their great hero of 19th century romantic fiction. And you know him from Les Miserables, you know him from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And um, I read about his process and he wrote Les Miserables. It took him about a decade uh, while he was in exile. He didn't get along with the government. Um, and uh, uh, it was one of the Napoleons who was the government at the time, the nephew, and got kicked out of the country. And he's living on this island in the, uh, in the English Channel. And um, I don't know whether he had running water or not, but it doesn't matter because what he would do is he would get up very early in the morning, like an hour before the sun, and he would write for three hours. And then he would take a break where he would take this pitcher of cold water and just pour it over his own head. And then he would get back to the writing. Now, I mean, he didn't have a computer. He didn't have to worry about splashing on his keyboard or anything like that. But that was his process. I guess just pouring that cold water over his head just gave him this shock that got him through another few hours. And that was his day. And you know, somewhere around noon, he'd knock off and he'd have you know, a nice meal and uh, maybe do some socializing with the other people in exile or the local island inhabitants, et cetera. Um, but I've always enjoyed that story because um, he was an early bird in his writing. He was very productive. And I should be so lucky as to um, have anything approaching the writing career of Victor Hugo. So let's, um, let's conclude by talking about some takeaways that I'd like um, you folks to, uh, to think about as we go forward. 
And uh, just to remind you, um, uh, Dean Behrman will be bringing me some of your questions. I understand they will be curated questions, um, but I'll be answering your questions in another one of these Zoom videos in just a few days. So takeaways from today's discussion. Um, I guess the first takeaway from the discussion and the book that I'd like you to think about is that African Americans, despite the fact that they almost monolithically today vote with the Democratic Party, are nevertheless as ideologically diverse as whites or any other group. Um, the reason why they vote monolithically today with the Democratic Party is because racism is still an important part of our American body politic and because civil rights are still not secure. And because there is a, because for African Americans in particular, uh, as well as for most uh, minority groups, but especially African Americans, and I would add Chinese and members of the Latinx community, especially, um, the story of American history has been a story of denying them their civil rights. And so um, because civil rights are still not secure, because racism is still extant to a huge extent in this country. Um, and, and finally, because one of the political parties has abandoned those issues as causes to champion, and that is the Republican Party, uh, African Americans primarily vote Democratic on election day. But that does not mean that they are ideologically monolithic. There is wide variety of ideological difference within the African American communities, and I, I say communities in plural on purpose. Uh, second, be like Fletcher by following your dreams, but being flexible. So Fletcher first wanted to be a soldier, a career soldier. He talks about his great regret that he was not allowed a seat in um, an officer training program in World War II because he wanted to come home and have his dad salute him. That would have been the great point of pride for him. Um, his dad would have had to salute him because his dad was an enlisted man. Uh, and if Arthur Fletcher had come home as an officer, his father would have had to salute. Um, and I'm sure his father would have saluted with pride. Um, but that didn't work out. He got shot in the abdomen. He was not going to have a career in the military. So then he set his sights on having a career in football. And some of you, um, in this lecture are on the football team, I imagine, or in another sport. And some of you may be thinking about pursuing a professional career in a sport. Um, and that's great, follow your dreams, just like he did. But again, be flexible. It may not work out, and if it doesn't, you wanna be in a position to have other options. And that's why Fletcher was so fortunate with the way he spent his time at Washburn. He got himself a job at, I'm not sure if it's even there anymore, but he got himself a job over at the Jayhawk Hotel. Um, where he would uh, be a waiter with the various politicos who would come in there to have their uh, three martini lunches back in the 50s. And he got himself a job as a doorman over at um, uh, the state capitol building. And he got to know people that way too. And one of the people he got to know a few years later became the governor. So again, take as many opportunities as you can so that you can be flexible. If one thing doesn't work out, you can move into another thing. Um, football didn't work out. He moved into politics, he moved into government. And that's where he found tremendous success, even if he didn't get everything he wanted. And even if his most overarching political goal in the end did not come true, um, he, I think we would all agree that if you've been, uh, if you've worked for five United States presidents, you've had a very successful political career. Most people don't get to work for one. And finally, be like Fletcher by making a difference. Like him, even if you don't completely fix the world, you can have incredible influence, especially on your colleagues, your students, and your friends. Think about every collegial relationship, every relationship with, your, with a professor, every relationship with a fellow student, every relationship with a friend, a family member, as an opportunity to make their life better, somehow. So again, the three takeaways. African Americans are as ideologically diverse as any other community. Be like Fletcher by following your dreams, but flexibly, but by being flexible. And finally, be like Fletcher by making a difference, even if you don't succeed at everything. So uh, Alan, uh, I'm, I'm all set. If you wanna come on back, 
So thank you, Dr. Golan. That was outstanding. Um, I'm going to make just a couple of closing comments for those of you watching this video so you know what comes next. Uh, let me begin by telling you that the interviews with Dr. Golan or the, the videos of Art Fletcher that Dr. Golan referenced are now available to you online. You can view those uh, via the Washburn University Institutional Repository to access the web page of maybe library and you can find those. Uh, but more importantly, those videos are going to become a part of the Arthur Fletcher collection at Washburn University. Dr. Golland has graciously donated to the Washburn University archives a wealth of materials that will become the Art Fletcher collection and those videos will be a part of that. The Fletcher collection is a digital repository that working with Dr. Golland uh, our librarians are making available to students and scholars over the next few months for additional research. And there is much more research that needs to be done into both the life of Art Fletcher and the time in, and, and that he worked and the experiences and the history that he helped play a in crucial role in. And so for some of you students, um, the opportunity to do this research is, is going to be real. And you're going to be able to do it right here at Washburn University. Firstly, thanks to Dr. Golland and some of our librarians who are working on that project. Again, if you go to the Maybe Library webpage, that's where this will unfold and you'll be able to find the Fletcher collection as it comes to life in a virtual form. Uh, thanks are also due to the Friends of Maybe Library and the Washburn Women's Venture Partners for their support of this I read, and of course to Dr. Golland for his truly outstanding presentation. Um, for many of you watching this I read lecture, you will now have questions for our author. And in a typical year, students, we would give you the opportunity to step forward and ask some of those questions. This year, we're asking that you uh, visit with your WU101 lead faculty member and librarian, share your questions with them, and then we'll send those to Dr. Golland, and he'll answer some again, uh, some of those for us again virtually. So again, one more time in closing, let's thank Dr. Golland for an outstanding 2020 iRead lecture. And thanks to you students and others for your participation in the 2020 IRE lecture. And we look forward to seeing you at the 2021 IRE lecture, hopefully in person. Thank you.